Um, so I'd like to, uh, let's see, this didn't quite work. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the organizers to give me uh, the opportunity to speak at this very nice conference. Uh, the title of my talk is Locality and Long Range Interacting AMO Systems. Uh, this is work that I did as a postdoc. Uh, mostly when I was at NIST and the Joint Quantum Institute with some coworkers also at the uh, Joint Center for Quantum Information at the University of Maryland. And uh, my theory collaborators on this project are all shown up here, and I'll also tell you a little bit, even though I'm a theorist, about some experimental uh, work that's been done at JQI along very similar lines, kind of studying the same ideas done by uh, Chris Monroe's group down here. Uh, so, a perfectly good alternative title to my talk uh, that I didn't use because I was afraid nobody would come is Mathematically Rigorous Bounds on the Growth of Entanglement in Non-Relativistic Long-Range Interacting Quantum Lattice Systems or Quantum Spin Systems. Uh, now, hopefully, uh, you'll see as I go along that the talk is not as technical as the uh, subject matter seems, and I hope you'll see that there's actually a lot of very simple physics kind of encoded in those words. Um, what I'm going to do is to first give you a little bit of background and motivation. I'll tell you what I mean by locality and non-relativistic quantum systems. Uh, and in particular, I'll tell you what people already know in the, in the case when interactions between particles are short range. So this is a relatively old story. Uh, I'll tell you then about the relevance of these kind of ideas to ongoing AMO experiments. Uh, and then I'll move on to tell you part of the talk that's probably the most interesting for this conference, namely what happens to this story when you include long-range interactions and how it gets modified. So I have to admit from the outset, uh, I'm not a mathematical physicist. So my introduction to mathematical physics is, is pretty basic, and it's really just to give you some context for sort of what the corner of that field that's working on these kind of quantum problems uh, is like. And I'll do that with, with just a simple example of the mathematical physics of Bose-Einstein condensation. So probably everybody here is familiar with at least sort of the physicist perspective on Bose-Einstein condensation. And I think that can be summed up something like this. So a long time ago, you know, 100 years ago almost, uh, Bose and Einstein proposed that for a non-interacting gas, uh, non, you know, identical bosonic particles should condense at low temperature into the lowest energy state. Now, it was thought that maybe this was just the pathology of non-interacting particles, but it was shown with, with some amount of rigor uh, by many people, sort of including the pioneering work of Bogliubov, uh, just a couple of decades later, that actually this phenomenon survives weak interactions, so at least it was reasonably well understood for weakly interacting gases. And by the end of the 20th century, people had even created these kind of things in the laboratory. So I think the physicist's perspective on BEC is that it's, it's, more, it's more or less understood what BEC is, how it works, and what its relation is to the physics of Bose fluids, so such as uh, you know, its role in superfluidity. Now, I think this misses a very important perspective on the problem, and that's the perspective of the mathematical physics uh, community. And a very important player in this is, is Elliot Lieb, and I hope there's at least a few big Lebowski fans uh, in the audience who can recognize who this is. But so he actually gave a talk in, in 1964 on BC at the University of Colorado, where BC was uh, made decades later. And uh, I, I, fortunately, there's actually video of this talk. Uh, it was put together into a movie uh, by the Cohen brothers. And I think on behalf of the mathematical physics community, he kind of summed up the attitude of the physicist, you know, toward the physicist perspective on BC in the following way. Yeah. Uh, your opinion, man. So, I think, I mean, actually for an for a, a, a American English speaker who came to Italy, I'm very kind of self-conscious because you know, everybody thinks that Italian is one of the most beautiful languages, and American English maybe not so much, but I think this is kind of good evidence that actually it can be quite beautiful. Um, now, okay, this is actually Elliot Lieb. Um, He's maybe even, even slightly more, more eloquent than the dude, so here's what he had to say about it. Uh, he said, 
To be sure, there have been attempts in the past to calculate the thermodynamic properties of liquid and solid helium, but in view of the fact that we're still not overconfident about even low-lying excited states, such calculations can hardly be the final word. And here at the end, my favorite, humility therefore requires that we acknowledge that our mathematics is still some distance behind physical reality, and hasty calculations and surmise cannot make it otherwise. So not something you'd probably hear from most physicists. Uh, my only point here is that when it comes to the quantum mechanics of many body systems, there's really not a whole lot that we know with the kind of mathematical rigor uh, that, that this man is sort of famous for. Uh, and of the things we do know, he's actually responsible for a relatively, kind of a shockingly large percentage of them. Okay, so he's one of sort of the two heroes uh, of this story, uh, along with uh, somebody he worked with, Derek Robinson. Uh, and so they did the pioneering work on, you probably can guess the name, Lee Robinson bounds. And, and basically what they showed is that there are speed limits to how fast entanglement can spread uh, in quantum mechanical systems. This was back in the 70s. And before I go into any details, I just want to emphasize that really, in some sense, what they showed it has a very simple intuitive picture. It's kind of natural to assume that it's true. And it comes about already in classical systems. So if you take just a material and you ask, you know, if I hit it at some point in space and time and I want to know how long does it take for a signal to propagate to some other point in space and time, well, you know, of course, there's the glib answer, well, it's not going to propagate faster than the speed of light, but this is not a very good answer. Uh, because we know in materials there's a speed of sound. And the key idea that gives rise to a speed of sound is basically that you have, uh, when you look inside a material, some kind of local interactions between the particles, and those interactions occur on some kind of bounded natural energy scale. So if you take the energy scale for two particles to talk to each other, you take the length scale separating them, you can combine this to form a velocity. And this is, you know, up to sort of many details that are swept under the rug, the speed of sound. And now you can think of this as sort of an effective light cone, of course, with a, a much reduced velocity. And it's not an exact light cone in the sense that signals can propagate outside of it. But for, for, for sort of most purposes, uh, it, serves the, it you know, serves pretty well as a light cone. Now, in light of that picture, what Lieben Robinson really did is they set out to answer the question um, of whether you can have uh, a speed of sound or the equivalent of a speed of sound for entanglement. And, and all throughout this talk, I'm talking strictly about non-relativistic systems, so where there isn't, strictly speaking, uh, real locality or, or causality, is however you want to call it. Okay, uh, again, before going into to more details, I want to give you a little bit of motivation that these kind of ideas are interesting, uh, that they're not you know, purely interesting within the realm of, of uh, a, just kind of academic interest, but also even within academic interest, they have many applications outside of just this topic. So one, one very kind of obvious uh, application of such a bound is that it constrains your ability to send quantum information in a quantum computation kind of framework. So if you have you know, two points connected by some intermediate nodes that are all interacting locally, these kind of bounds will set a limit on how fast you could do something like distribute entanglement between these two distant places. Uh, somewhat more subtly, but also a very beautiful connection, is that these kind of bounds even control the equilibrium physics that's possible uh, in, in sort of many different types of many-body quantum systems. And the argument goes something like this. I'll just give you one simple example. So take uh, the quantum Ising model. So I guess this is sort of like the quantum uh, uh, HMF model. It's like one of the most canonical quantum models that you could have. And uh, the physics here is that of the competition between spins wanting to align with each other to form a ferromagnetic state and a transverse field that's trying to polarize them in, in the transverse direction. And so if you plot the phase diagram now as a, as a, as a function of this coupling, what you, so that's down here, what you find is that for small couplings, the spins just align with this field. We say this state is not magnetized because it doesn't spontaneously break any symmetry of the Hamiltonian. And then as you turn up the field, there is a second order phase transition at which the magnetization suddenly turns on and you get a state that spontaneously breaks the inversion symmetry you know, along the z-axis of this Hamiltonian, either all pointing up or down. And if you also look at uh, the, the excitation gap between the ground state of this model and the first excited state, that gap is generally finite throughout the phase diagram with the sole exception of, of the critical point right here. So now imagine you want to create some kind of highly correlated ground state that's not you know, sitting right here where this state is trivial or way out here where this state is trivial, but somewhere in between. You could do that by preparing the system over here 
and now turning on your, you know, your interactions, and you would try to do it adiabatically. And your ability to turn them on adiabatically, this is guaranteed by the existence uh, of a gap. So if you now turn up the interactions, you'll find that entanglement grows in the system, but you know, the time that you can do this in adiabatically by the adiabatic theorem scales like one over this gap, and if you have a speed limit on how entanglement can spread, that's going to tell you that the entanglement in your system is restricted to distance scales that are less than, than this quantity. So this is a much more general feature of many body uh, systems. Indeed, if you take any kind of you know, lattice system, as long as you can connect adiabatically the ground state of the model to a trivial product state, then by turning on interactions in a time t, you'll find that the ground state develops uh, correlations only over a length scale l, that's just t times the lieb robinson velocity, the velocity that bounds entanglement growth. Now, there are pretty profound consequences of this kind of thing. So for, for one, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to understand the classical complexity of simulating a many-body spin system like this, now I'm getting into a little bit dangerous grounds because unless I put lots of qualifiers in, not everything I say will be strictly true. But it, it's, it's often the case that the computational complexity of simulating such a, in a ground state of such a system classically scales exponentially with the entanglement entropy of uh, a reduced density matrix of one of the subsystems. So for example, if I draw a line and cut off subsystem A from B, uh, then the entanglement entropy of the reduced density matrix of A, and this is really just sort of you know, counting the, the, the bits of kind of classical uncertainty that you have about the state of A if you don't measure B. And that all comes from these entangled bonds that cross this interface. So it's proportional to the number of bonds that break this interface, and that tells you right away that the entanglement entropy scales not with the volume of the system, as you might expect for an entropy, but actually just with the area, the, bound, the boundary area of uh, subsystem A. So this is what people call uh, the area law, and in 1D, so people have actually used, uh, Matt Hastings in 2007, yeah, uh, he used the Lee Robinson bound to prove that for gapped 1D systems, uh, where, for reasons related to this kind of adiabatic argument I gave, but not exactly the same, uh, it turns out that uh, the, the area law holds, and the area law in 1D just says that the boundary of a subsystem is independent of the system size. It's just a single point, right, the boundary of a 1D system. And this has very deep connections to why we know, in many cases, how to efficiently simulate one-dimensional quantum systems classically. Okay, so with, with all of that uh, motivation, let me now jump into describing in a little bit more detail what these Lee Robinson bounds actually are and, and what they say in the case of short range interactions. So for simplicity, uh, they're, they're quite a bit more general than this, but let's just focus on lattice spin models. So a bunch of spins lined up. It could be in any dimension. These could be spin one half or one, any, any spin you want. And, and I want you to keep in mind for what comes later that this is really not just some abstraction. In, in AMO, we have many systems that to a good degree of approximation uh, realize quantum Hamiltonians on, on such kind of spin models. And you've already seen examples uh, from yesterday and, and earlier in which you can do this with trapped ions or Rydberg atoms, many different things. So the kind of Hamiltonian you might consider is, say, uh, something like two-body interactions. So this is just the most generic Hamiltonian you could write with two-body spin-spin interactions. Uh, and these coupling constants, we're just going to constrain them to be, you can take your pick, either exponentially decaying or nearest neighbor or finite range, we'll call all of those things short range. They all count as short range for this purpose. And that's the case that Lieb and Robinson treated. So how do you understand uh, locality in such a system? Well, a very natural way to define it is to think about what would happen if you perturb the system locally. So imagine you couple some operator A to a spin over here at time zero and position R equals zero. And then you wait some time later and you want to measure the expectation value of an operator sitting out here. So at a distance r away, at a time t later. So you know from, from very sort of standard many body theory that, that this is defined by a causal response function. And so basically this is just saying that the causal response is this function q sub r is given by first, I take my state and I perturb it by evolving it under this operator a at time zero, just a little bit. And then this is acting on the bra. And then at a time later, B is evolving in the Heisenberg picture under this Hamiltonian. I measure B, and I subtract off what I would have measured if I hadn't perturbed the system. So that's the causal response. And uh, you can see just after one line of algebra that this gives you a commutator between the operator A at time 0 and the operator B at time t. So it's really this commutator that captures the, the sort of causality or locality structure of the theory. Now, 
it's not very convenient to deal with operators. Um, so it turns out that probably the most natural thing that you, could, that you could try to bound is not the commutator itself, but the operator norm of it. So it doesn't matter if you don't know what this is. It's, it's basically the, the, just the largest eigenvalue of this operator. Um, but the important point is that because it's the largest eigenvalue, it bounds from above uh, all possible expectation values of this operator. So it's a good measure of how big the operator is. And in relativistic field theory, you may be familiar with the idea that it's exactly this commutator that the theory is sort of constructed to ensure is equal to zero at space-like separation. So it's this, it's the identical vanishing of this outside of the light cone that you, that you sort of get in a, in a relativistic theory. Now, in non-relativistic theories, uh, it's in fact not going to vanish at any point in space in general after a finite time of evolution. But you still expect, you know, given the qualitative arguments I gave you earlier, that it could decay in space when you're sufficiently far away at a finite time. And so what Lieben Robinson did is to bound this norm by some function that depends on distance and time. And let me just give you, uh, well, sorry. So let me just say uh, one final kind of technical piece is that from a function like this, the way that this kind of defines a light cone is very simple. You just say, well, let me, uh, let me insist that you know, causality is almost enforced. So this, this bound is less than some small number. And this equation right here will define an inequality in the t and r plane for where you can have uh, you know, influences propagating. So this defines a causal region. So this is the analog of, of the light cone for a relativistic system, uh, or for a non-relativistic system. Okay, so the way Lieb and, and Robinson actually did this uh, is as follows. I'm just going to kind of sketch it because I don't want to go into, into all of the uh, hairy details. But they basically showed that you can write this kind of a quantity as a series that has a very natural physical interpretation. So it's a power series uh, in time. And at every order in time, you have some coefficient that depends on your distance in space. And what these coefficients are is, you can think of it kind of like a path integral. They're basically, you know, if this is the operator A and this is the operator B, and they're sitting a distance R apart, the nth coefficient is just obtained by summing all the different paths that you can take to get from A to B, where this path is created by using links. And these links here are just the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. For, so for a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, all of the paths would just go from one lattice site to the next. So it, it turns out, actually, all of the hard work is in writing down this expression. Once you have it, you can do this kind of a sum, or at least you can bound this kind of a sum in just a few lines of algebra. And what you find is, is Lieben-Robinson uh, Lieben seminal result. So this function for short-range interactions is bounded by this functional form, e to the vt minus r. And v here is the Lieben-Robinson velocity. And generally, this is just related to the energy scale associated with the short-range spin-spin coupling in the model. So if you take this function and do what I said, you set it equal to a small number, what you find is that this defines a linear light cone, so very much like a relativistic system. If you look at a fixed time, at a cut through space, what you find is that the Lieb-Robinson bound, well, it doesn't actually tell you very much useful inside the light cone, so don't worry about what's going on in here. But outside the light cone, it tells you that you, can, that you know for a fact that this, uh, this quantity is going to decay as an exponential in space outside of the, the light cone. OK, uh, so I want to move on now to describing sort of, uh, or giving a little bit of motivation for why these kinds of things are, are nice to study in AMO systems. And then I'll talk about uh, the generalization to long range interactions. So uh, I have a slide here that I feel a little bit guilty giving. People have given many, many beautiful you know, talks about AMO physics. But I think there's one thing that the AMO physics community often doesn't express to people that are outside uh, the community. And that's what we mean when we say that AMO systems are, are very cold. And so if you compare, for example, an AMO system to a condensed matter system, you can do a very simple calculation of the relevant energy scales by just thinking, well, let me think an AMO system is basically an atom moving around typically on length scales of a wavelength of light. Uh, that defines a kinetic energy, which is, uh, well, sorry, actually, I guess I did it in the other order, but it defines a kinetic energy that's like 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. If you put an electron in, in you know, a lattice, you know, sort of a unit cell of a material, you'd find a comparable energy, the Fermi energy, that's on the order of 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So the relevant energy scales for cold atoms are like about 10 to the minus 12 colder than for real materials. Uh, 
So, you know, people often say that ultra-cold atoms can simulate the physics of something like a high-temperature superconductor by putting atoms in a lattice. And while that's true, you should keep in mind that it's only true if you make them 10 to the, you know, 12 times colder. And if you look at what typical experimental temperatures are, they're actually quite a bit hotter than what you need. So the, the sort of state of the art in cooling, say, fermionic gases, leaves us with metal, with, you know, cold atom systems that are analogous to metals, roughly in the sort of 1,000 to 10,000 degree temperature range. So they're really not that cold in this very important sense. So what that means is that e equilibrium is actually very hard to achieve at the kind of temperatures that people would like to see it in cold atoms. And the reason is simple. It's just that to get to very low temperatures, you have to wait very long times, or you have to cool for very long times, or find very powerful cooling methods. And these things are always going to be susceptible to all of the dirt that people don't like to talk about that, of course, exists in AMO systems. They're not perfectly clean. And on some time scales, that becomes relevant. Now, that's not to say that uh, things are hopeless. I think there's a huge amount of beautiful work trying to push those temperatures down, and people will probably get there, and there's a lot of beautiful equilibrium physics to be seen. I just want to emphasize for people that are outside the AMO community that it's really, in many ways, more natural to study non-equilibrium problems in cold atoms. And I think that's why you've seen so many examples over the last week of AMO physicists talking about non-equilibrium physics using everything from Rydberg atoms to ions. Um, and the real benefit is that these low energy scales that make equilibrium physics hard, they get traded in, you know, just by dimensional analysis for slow time scales that make it very easy to observe on, say, millisecond or even longer time scales, the dynamics that's going on in these systems. And uh, indeed, I guess uh, several years ago, so there was a very beautiful experiment from Emmanuel Bloch's group uh, in which he showed that you can take ultra-cold atoms, put them in an optical lattice, so they have these, these atoms have short-range interactions. Uh, and you can, you can kick the system, and you can watch the growth of correlations, or basically of entanglement in this system, and you can see that it obeys a sort of Lee robinson style light cone. So very beautiful experiments. Um, I, what I'm really interested in in this talk is, is the additional knob that cold atoms give you, that let you go beyond that picture, and that is the ability to control the range of the interactions. And that it lets us kind of get out of the regime where the results of these guys already tell us what to expect and into much newer territory where it's less clear what should go on. So just to sort of uh, give you a quick uh, picture to jog your memory of what people have already talked about, there's many AMO systems where you can, where you can have different interactions like 1 over R cubed or 1 over R to the 6 interactions in Rydberg atoms, 1 over R cubed interactions in polar molecules. You can even vary the interaction strength, uh, range in, in trapped ions. And in cavity QED, you can have all-to-all -all interactions very naturally. Um, so there have been, in, in about a year ago, there were two very nice papers, one of which uh, Christian Roos already talked about, uh, studying what happens to this kind of light cone physics when you take a system with long-range interactions and disturb it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the experiment that went on at the Joint Quantum Institute because I know about it much better, and it hasn't already been talked about. So this is an experiment from Chris Monroe's group. And uh, I'll give you the, the theorist kind of, you know, morally correct but wrong in lots of the details reminder of what's going on in these kind of experiments and how they, they, they replicate spin models. So uh, for Chris Monroe, he uses as his, his spin degree of freedom, he, well, he takes a bunch of ytterbium ions, they're trapped in a linear trap, and they crystallize into this kind of pattern. Uh, the spin degree of freedom for the spin model is just two different hyperfine states of this atom. The way you get spin models, qualitatively, it's very simple. If you shine a laser on an ion, imagine you fix all the other ones so only that ion can move, you can understand its response by thinking, well, it's just sort of in a harmonic potential formed by the springs around it. Uh, and for technical reasons in their case, they have to create this excitation with two lasers through an optically excited state. But the important point is they can generate transitions that, that impart momentum. So they kick this thing in the harmonic oscillator. And at the same time, they flip the spin. So you go from down to up, and you jump up with one quantum of motion. Now, if you shine a laser onto all the systems at the same time, you get terms like this summed over the entire lattice. And if you add now uh, the propagation of the phonons due to the you know, phonon phonon coupling uh, in the lattice, you get a picture like this. So it's, it's, it's very similar to, Q, to uh, QED, where you get an interaction mediated by virtual particles. So you can have spin flips that are mediated by virtual photons being sent back and forth. 
Now, uh, in exactly that way, uh, but with many you know, more details to worry about in reality, they can create Hamiltonians that look like this. So they can create Ising models uh, with or without a transverse field. They can also create XY spin models. So these are, you can think of this as sort of like a flip-flop model where excitations are exchanged between different ions. Um, and for all of these models, they can control the range of the interactions. So they fall off like one over R to the alpha, where alpha can go from zero to three in principle. So the experiment looks kind of like this. So let's see, they take, uh, they take their system at the initial time, and they just optically pump all of the atoms into one spin state, so they initialize it in some state that they know very well. And then they apply an effective field in this spin space, so they just rotate it into some non-equilibrium state. After that rotation, during this time, they turn on their, their many-body Hamiltonian, this say the XY model in the example that I'll show you. That induces correlations uh, to form between the spins. After the correlations have formed for some time t, they then apply one final rotation. And you can think of this rotation passively as just kind of rotating the axis in spin space along which they end up imaging. So this final rotation just lets them read out along any direction in spin space that they want. And in that way, they can measure really basically any correlation function that you, know, that you might write down. It's numerically hard to measure sort of, or it's experimentally hard to measure very high order correlation functions, but this kind of connected correlation function is relatively straightforward. And they see something like this when they do that. So here's an example of their data where time's now plotted on this axis. The correlation between, this was an 11 ion chain, so this is the ion on you know, the left and the right side of the chain. And these two different curves represent two different values of alpha that they chose. And you see basically what you'd expect. So for alpha relatively small, this black curve, the correlations turn on relatively quickly in time. And for alpha slightly bigger, so for slightly shorter range interactions, uh, it takes some time for the correlations to actually develop across the chain. And if you do exactly this experiment, but now not just between the first and the last ion, but between all different ions, you can make a plot like this. So now this whole plot is just a single cut in time. And now we're doing this again at every position R. And you can see how these correlations develop in space and time. And you can see what the boundary is uh, that controls where the correlations can spread to. So clearly, uh, from these plots, there does not appear to be any sort of good notion of a linear light cone. Um, nor should there be. You shouldn't expect one to be, right? Because the Lee Robinson theorem only applies in its original form to systems with short range interactions. And these systems, by their definition of short range interactions, are not short ranged for any power law. Um, so, in the future, I think, you know, while those experiments were relatively small scale and maybe don't tell you a lot that you can't learn by just doing simulations on a computer. People will move eventually towards larger systems. So 1D systems can be made larger just by making them cryogenic, which I say I get to say just because I'm a theorist. Of course, that's very challenging. Uh, and also, people study 2D systems of trapped ions that are already working with sort of hundreds of ions. So these are relatively large systems for which classical computations are pretty intractable. OK, so let me now tell you what we can say about, uh, about Lee Robinson bounds in the situation where uh, interactions are long ranged. So remember, for short range, we had this linear light cone bounding a causal region. For long range interactions, and long range here, I'm going to define as a power law, and it just has to be true that alpha is greater than d. So any alpha greater than d, I'm going to call all of that long range because it's not captured in here. But it is captured by work in 2005 by Hastings and Coma. And what they showed was that you can generalize the Lee Robinson bound. And you get still uh, a light cone by the definition I gave you, but it has a very strange shape. It doesn't look anything like the linear light cone. It actually grows logarithmically uh, in distance. And if you think about it, it's really kind of strange for two reasons. One, a logarithm means uh, it, it, that the causal region is basically everywhere, right? This, you know, a log grows kind of as slow as anything can grow. You can also think of this as implying that the maximum group velocity is kind of growing exponentially in time. Also very strange. Another strange feature is that this, this power law exponent alpha sits out here. You can take alpha to be as large as you want. And it doesn't change the fact that this situation looks nothing like this situation, right? It's still a log, no matter how big alpha is. Um, now, in the case when alpha is less than d, uh, it's also been shown by a nice paper in 2013 uh, by people including one of our esteemed uh, organizers here that uh, the causal region just doesn't exist. 
So you can construct models explicitly for alpha less than the dimension of space where there just is no well-defined causal region. Now, even if we restrict our attention to alpha greater than d, uh, there would be some pretty, pretty strange consequences if the Hastings coma bound was, well, I don't know, I don't want to say this right. It's, it's of course right. I mean, they derived it and it's a mathematical result. But if it's a good bound, so if, if real physical systems could actually saturate it, that would have very strange consequences. So for example, you could distribute entanglement in a quantum system in a time that scales just with the logarithm of the size of the system. It also kind of implies that entanglement in, in ground states of, long, of power law interacting systems, even for very large power laws, can have very long range entanglement and violate the area law, which is not something that we generally see uh, happening. So the question that I want to ask in the remainder of the talk is, can there actually be a logarithmic light cone? And to understand the answer to that question, you have to look a little bit in detail at how this calculation goes. Uh, and it's very similar to the original Lee Robinson calculation. It again is related to this kind of a series. The only difference really is that in these paths that you sum over, these bonds no longer have to be nearest neighbor. They can be any length you want, and they should just be assigned a weight that's related to the size of the interaction matrix element at that distance. So if you analyze uh, this kind of a series carefully, what you find is that it's actually dominated by terms because you pay so much for these long distance kind of very small bonds. It's dominated by terms where you have one bond going almost the entire distance r, which is about the size one over r to the alpha, and all of the rest of the bonds kind of stay close to the starting point. And because they stay close to the starting point, you might see that uh, you could understand the, the sum of all of the paths going from here to here just via a short-range Lee Robinson bound, because these are all comprised of kind of short-ranged uh, you know, interaction matrix elements. And so they should give you a contribution that's like this e to the vt minus r, only with r set equal to 0, because we're putting this point you know, almost back near the origin. So if you just multiply these two contributions out, you get something that looks you know, almost exactly what, like what Hastings and Coma derived, a bound that goes like e to the vt over r to the alpha. And it's setting this bound equal to a small constant to get the light cone that gives you this logarithmic light cone. Uh, sorry, yeah, there should be an alpha sitting out here. So to understand what kind of goes, what, what goes wrong in this derivation or what's missed by this derivation about the physics, you should take a look at uh, this kind of approximation in here, or not approximation, but this way of bounding the part of the path going from here to this point. So we bounded this by a Lieb Robinson bound, a short range Lieb Robinson bound. But if you notice the short range Lieb Robinson bound, this e to the vt minus r, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to apply it when your distance is within the light cone, right? It tells you very useful information out here that outside the light cone boundary, this function decays exponentially. But inside the light cone, we know that this bound was supposed to be a bound on the commutator of some spin operators, right? So they're just kind of operators with norm of order one. So we can really impose a trivial bound that just says when you get inside the light cone, the commutator that we're after just can't be larger than something of order one. So the problem is it's, it's difficult technically to actually take that into account in, in reproducing these kind of bounds. But the trick to doing it uh, was sort of worked out in this paper from 2015 by me and some coworkers at JQI. And so what you do is you have to separate the long distance physics from the short range physics in, in uh, a specific way. So I'm just going to define now arbitrarily just by fiat this, this cutoff in distance chi. And this separates kind of the long range tail of my Hamiltonian from some finite range, so I'll call it a short range, part. Now, the way that we, we take into account the fact that the, the contributions of the short range Hamiltonian, as they cause the system to evolve within its short range light cone, have this unitarity property where they just can't make the operators get any bigger, right? They're, the operator, uh, this commutator that we're after bounding, always stays at most of order one. Uh, the way to build that structure into the theory from the outset is to immediately go into the interaction picture with respect to this uh, part of the Hamiltonian. So we build the short range Hamiltonian into the, the theory in a way that explicitly preserves its unitarity. And so here, formally, uh, if, if you, you know, have thought about this kind of stuff before, you'll know what's being written here. But it's just saying that the operators in the interaction picture, they just evolve under this short range Hamiltonian. But the time evolution operator is now given by this long-range Hamiltonian piece that is also itself evolving under the short-range Hamiltonian. 
And if you now plot uh, kind of the, the kind of plot that I showed you before, but now driving the bound in the interaction picture, you're now expanding in this Lee Robinson series, this time evolution operator. And the terms that show up in it look a lot like they did uh, for, for the case previously, with one exception, or two exceptions. So one is that, so each of these bonds is basically one of these long range Hamiltonians. And the endpoints get kind of smeared out because they're being evolved under the short range Hamiltonian. So these operators leak out a little bit, but they're constrained by a short range Lee Robinson bound. So they're very localized, or they're exponentially localized. You can think of them as almost being point like. And now the point is by making chi large in a suitable way, we can keep this long range part of the Hamiltonian uh, relatively small, right? We can just push this out until the integrated weight here is small, at least if alpha is you know, sufficiently large compared to d. Uh, and so what we do is, you know, in this way, we, we sort of operate in a perturbative regime in, in this long range Hamiltonian where we can't have very many bonds. And we get away from this problem where lots of them pile up at short distance and cause this exponential time dependence that you saw in the Hastings and Coma bond. bond. So, all of that said, what you end up with at the end of the day, if you do the calculation carefully, and you also optimize over uh, the location where you put this cutoff, is you find a bound that looks like, like uh, well, a bound that gives rise to a causal region that looks like this. So T is no longer a log of R, but it can be shown to always go as a polynomial of R, at least if alpha is larger than twice the dimensionality of space. So uh, a couple of you know, power laws are shown here, and the nice feature is that as you make alpha larger, if you plot this power law exponent beta as a function of alpha, uh, it only makes sense for alpha greater than 2D, as I said, and it converges to 1 out for large alpha. So as alpha becomes large, you now recover this original Lieb and Robinson picture where you have a linear light going, as you expect to. Um, so again, this, this, this rules out things like the ability to transfer information you know, in just log R time in a quantum system. It tells you it can only be a polynomial of R. Um, it also turns out that you can use this kind of improved bound to show that in power law interacting systems, uh, at least if they're gapped, their correlations will decay uh, as a power law which is something that people, I think, broadly expect and see in a lot of numerics, but I think this is the only way I know of, at least, to get a rigorous proof that that should be the case for all quantum systems uh, that satisfy these conditions, the gap ground state. Um, so just as an outlook before I finish, um, you can kind of divide now the state of what's known into, into a few different categories along this axis. So for alpha less than d, as I told you, uh, there are explicit examples where you don't have a causal region, so we know that's true. Well, for alpha between d and 2d, we don't really know what's going on. I apologize for this. This should have been alpha equals 2d. Uh, for alpha greater than 2d, we know that there is a light cone that's a polynomial. Uh, so it's a polynomial in particular that becomes increasingly linear as you make the interaction in shorter range. And then you might expect, although we... we don't know how to prove that for alpha sufficiently large beyond some kind of critical uh, value, you actually get back the truly short range character of the problem. And you don't just pick up this linear light cone asymptotically for large alpha, but you get it exactly beyond some, some threshold. Um, I think this is sort of where some of our research is going, but there's a lot left to be done to, to show this kind of a thing. Um, one of the nice results recently by one of my collaborators at JQI was just to uh, kind of abandon this approach of driving rigorous bounds and show that at the very least, this kind of picture is what you see if you look at the dynamics of non-relativistic uh, quantum field theory. So you do find that in general, beyond some threshold, you get a strictly linear light cone uh, for power law interactions. Um, and let me just uh, wrap up by saying we're hiring postdocs, so if you have any interest in, in living in Washington, D.C., uh, you should email me down here, and I don't blame you if you want to wait until next year and see uh, who your next-door neighbors might be. Uh, thanks for your time. <laughs>